Good morning and welcome to Sunday School for today. I'm glad that you decided to join and I hope you, you've had a great week. We've had uh, all sorts of weather, so we should have had some that appeases everybody. We had some cool air, we had some rain, we had sunshine, we had breezes. So uh, I hope that everybody's had a great week. And I have to warn you, I have the girls. They're busy right now, but we'll see just how far I get without being interrupted. Our lesson for today is session 11 from the quarterly. And it's almost time to go and pick up new quarterlies. I hope you'll do that because you learn so much more when you read the lesson for yourself. But if you're following in your Bible, then the lesson comes from Luke chapter 23. Last week, we focused on the night of Jesus' arrest and the fact that Peter denied Jesus three times. During that night, Jesus endured several formal trials. The first was, of course, his interrogation by the high priest, Annas, and then Caiaphas. The religious leaders uh, did not have authority to condemn a person to death, so they took him before the Roman governor, Pilate, for the second trial of the night. And before Pilate, they accused Jesus of encouraging people to not pay taxes, and they said that Jesus wanted to be king. Well, that was enough to get the attention of the Romans. However, after questioning Jesus, Pilate felt there was no ground for further action. And in order to release himself from the burden, he sent Jesus before Herod, who ruled the region of Galilee. And Herod just happened to be in Jerusalem at the time. And since Jesus was from Galilee, that seemed an easy way out of the situation for Pilate. So the third trial of the night was uh, before Herod. Now that trial focused on the miracles that Jesus had performed. Herod evidently had heard about them and he was glad to see Jesus because he wanted him to perform. He wanted the whole circus act in front of him. He wanted Jesus to do a miracle so that he could witness it. But Jesus would not play his game. He did not play into the hands of Herod and neither would he answer his questions. So Herod turned Jesus over to his soldiers. Now they put a robe on Jesus, but it was all in mockery and they mistreated him and returned him to Pilate. And then that began the fourth trial of the night and it was the final trial. Jesus was the last person that Pilate wanted to see that night because he knew none of the charges against him were valid. They had brought no evidence to confirm anything that they were accusing Jesus of. He brought out a prisoner, Barabbas, in hopes that executing him would appease the crowd's bloodthirst and he could release Jesus. He made several attempts to free Jesus, but the crowd was not dissuaded. They kept shouting for the crucifixion of Jesus and Pilate, knowing his position with Caesar could be threatened, gave in to the angry crowd. So the journey past the city gates and up the hill to the place of crucifixion began. Now this place was known by different names. It was called the Skull, Calvary, and Golgotha, depending on the authors who were giving the account of the crucifixion. But no name changed the fact that it was a place of torturous death. It was a humiliating and a public death. The Romans placed those being crucified in open places for everyone to see. In fact, they hoped that people would witness because they felt it would serve as a deterrent for further crimes. And also it was a way of terrorizing the general population and keeping them under control. By the time of this day, remember Jesus had been on trial all night. He was weak from beatings, probably from... Um, malnutrition or um, lack of water to drink, but the criminals were forced to carry their own cross to their execution. And Jesus was struggling with the weight of his cross. So the Romans forced another person, Simon of Cyrene, to carry the cross for him. Cyrene is in North Africa, and it was a place where Judaism was prevalent. So this person may have traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover events, and he just found himself 
in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now, all of that brings us to the first scriptures for today's lesson, which is chapter 23, verses 33 through 34. When they arrived at the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. And they divided his clothes and cast lots. Several people followed Jesus up to Calvary, the Jewish leaders, the Roman soldiers, two other two criminals, and some of Jesus' followers at they probably stayed at a distance to protect themselves. Women cried for him, but Jesus urged them to weep for themselves and their children instead of for him. As people traveled into and away from Jerusalem, they too may have stopped to witness all the commotions. The Romans made sure that the executions were very visible and in high traffic areas. A condemned man was stretched across a rough cross frame as an executioner drove nails through his hands or through his wrists. And nails were also driven through feet to fasten them to the vertical beam of the cross. A criminal was placed on either side of Jesus that day, one on the left and one on the right. Now we see pictures of three crosses up on a hill with the third cross appearing to be taller than the others as if it was something different. There was nothing different about the center cross except that the person on it was innocent and he was the son of God, the Messiah that was sent for our salvation and for the salvation of all those in the crowd that day. Jesus had submitted to God's will in the Garden of Gethsemane, remember when he prayed, and he was focused now on his purpose at this very point, he was experiencing excruciating pain, just like the other men hanging beside him. But he did not ask for relief. Instead, he prayed for forgiveness of those at his feet who did not understand what they were doing. All the soldiers uh, divided his clothes and cast lots for his garment. They were playing a game. The executioners didn't realize they were crucifying the Son of God. But Jesus' prayer applied to them, and it applied to everyone else then and now. He knew his death was the only way that even we can be forgiven. Jesus' prayer should become our guide when we're tempted to respond in anger or vengeance toward people who offend us. If he could display that level of forgiveness as he hung on the cross, then how much more should we be willing and able to display an attitude of grace toward people who've done much less to us? Now, our next scriptures will be verses um, 35 through 39. The people stood watching, and even the leaders were scoffing. He saved others. Let him save himself if this is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him. They came offering him sour wine and said, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. An inscription was above him. This is the king of the Jews. And then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. There were several different groups of people witnessing the crucifixion that day. One group may have consisted of curious bystanders that just happened to be there as they traveled into or out of the city. And also in this group may have been some of Jesus' supporters and followers, although they might have kept and watched at a distance. A second group, of course, were the Sanhedrins, the religious opponents who followed along to celebrate their victory in finally ridding themselves of Jesus, or so they thought. They mocked him saying, if, if he was the son, uh, if he was the son of God, if he was, if he was God's Messiah, then he should save himself. Another group was the Roman soldiers who were carrying out their duty of crucifying the three men hanging on the crosses. There was an inscription above Jesus that stated he was the king of the Jews. The soldiers mocked by saying, if you're the king, save yourself. 
they offered him a drink and it was sour wine like vinegar but it was not to quench his thirst they were not doing it out of kindness it was as a bigger insult and mockery the inscription above jesus this is the king of the jews was an insult to the religious leaders they tried to get Pilate to change the wording to say he claims to be the king of the Jews. And they knew that title pointed to Jesus as the one who fulfilled God's promise to King David that he would have a descendant reign forever. If you remember, in their search for the newborn child, the wise men sought the one who was born king of the Jews. So the request of the religious leaders did not sway Pilate at this time. He would not change the wording, not because he believed that Jesus to be the promised Messiah, but that message above a crucified person would deter anyone else from trying to take over his reign. And even the criminals joined in with the taunting. Pain and suffering can sometimes bring out the worst in people. And one of those attempted to alleviate his pain by heaping insults and abuse on Jesus, just like the crowd below. He taunted Jesus by asking if he wasn't the Messiah. Well, save yourself and us. He didn't care if Jesus saved himself. He didn't care if he was the Messiah. It was a selfish uh, statement that he made. In his last hours, sadly, he was only thinking of himself. At first, both of the criminals showed no sympathy for the man in the middle of them. But after some time had passed, one of them began to think differently. And we see that in the next scriptures, which will be verses 40 through 43. But the other answered, rebuking him, don't you even fear God since you were undergoing the same punishment? We are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things that we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. <clears throat> one of the criminals began to rebuke the other one that was hurling the insults to Jesus. He realized the two of them were receiving punishment justly. And they were guilty of their crimes and had been convicted in a fair trial. But he also realized that Jesus had done nothing wrong. He made a request that reflected his genuine repentance and acknowledgement that Jesus was the Messiah. He asked to be remembered by Jesus when, uh, when he came into his kingdom. And he didn't say the kingdom. He said Jesus' kingdom, when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus responded with love and grace and mercy. He promised the man would be with him on that very day in paradise. The words paradise and heaven were used interchangeably in the Old Testament, but they both signified the dwelling place of those who received God's righteousness. The criminal did not continually ask Jesus to remember him. He asked, Jesus answered, and he believed without a doubt. Now, our final scriptures would be 44 through 46. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three because the sun's light failed. The curtain of the sanctuary was split down the middle and Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, Unto your hands I entrust my spirit. Saying this, he breathed his last. The crucifixion began around nine o'clock in the morning. Jesus suffered for three hours until about 12 o'clock when darkness fell over the land. And it was not a few minutes that we would see darkness like in a solar eclipse. It was a darkness that lasted for three hours. His son may have been dying on the cross, but God was still in control of his creation. The presence of God was represented by the Holy of Holies, a place where the Ark of the Covenant was housed. And this area was separated from ordinary people by a heavy curtain. And during those three hours of darkness from 12 o'clock to three, the curtain was torn from top to bottom, indicating that God 
did the ripping himself, and he was no longer present, only in a place where a high priest could enter. Access to God for all people was opened up and made available at that moment. With a loud voice, Jesus submitted his spirit to God and breathed his last breath. His death removed the barrier between the holy God and sinful man. We don't need a mediator to go to God on our behalf. We can ask, receive forgiveness, and communicate with God by our own prayers. Now, from our lesson today, may we understand that Jesus was not a victim of circumstances. Had he not embraced God's will, the Sanhedrin, the Roman government, the soldiers would have had no power over him. He knew, however, the only path for our forgiveness was by his atoning sacrifice on the cross. So it was for us that he gave himself. In verse 46, Jesus quoted part of Psalm 31, which says uh, in verse 5 of Psalm 31, Unto your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. Psalm 31 was used in ancient Israel a lot of times for a child's bedtime prayer. And at that moment on the cross, when Jesus prayed that prayer and made that statement, he closed his eyes like a child in the dark of night with the confidence that he would wake up to the light of the morning and he was safe in the arms of God. I know that there are many items and people on our prayer list, but let's not forget our prayers of praise and thanksgiving, uh, thankfulness this week. Sometimes that's our weakest part of our prayers when we forget to thank God for all the blessings that he's given to us. But in those prayers of thanksgiving, let's be mindful of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us and for the free path of salvation that that sacrifice provided. I want to thank you for joining in today again. I know that there are many ways that you could be spending your time, so I'm surely glad that you chose to lend a few minutes to this Sunday school lesson. I hope you'll have a great week ahead, and I hope that you'll join in again next time. Thank you so much.